Hey, welcome to Black Gumbo. Are you a new gardener? Have you put in a new garden and perhaps it's your first time gardening or you're getting back to it? Uh, this is a video about how to maintain that garden, especially tailored for new gardeners. Okay, so you've got your garden in. Maybe you're a new gardener, maybe you're just getting back to it. And now it's in place, your plants are up and everything's looking great. How do you maintain your garden through the growing season so that you'll have a harvest? Well, I'm gonna talk about four different points of uh, maintaining your garden today. Four of them, let's get started with number one. Weeding your garden is something that is required because your plants are down there growing, uh, seeking resources, nutrition, water uh, from the soil. And if you've got a bunch of competition, a bunch of weeds growing around, uh, those weeds are better at mining your soil of its nutrition and of its moisture and of using up everything that you've worked so hard to put into that soil. Uh, weeds, um, just because they're so successful, have been adapted to uh, you know grow in just about anything, but if you put them in this rich, wonderful soil that you've made, they're gonna they're gonna overtake the plants that you are cultivating uh, to eat. And so, all these plants that we're nur nurturing along, these cabbages and carrots and radishes and turnips and stuff, uh, they're not wild type plants. This stuff doesn't grow easily in the wild. They're quickly overtaken. So if you go in and remove the weeds, you give them a better chance of flourishing there in your garden. So that's why we go and we weed our gardens. You got to keep the weeds down or you won't have a successful garden. Uh, for weeding in uh, broad areas where you can get tools in, I use uh, three tools primarily. Uh, one is this little garden hoe. It's a tiny little hoe so I can get in between my uh, narrow spaced plants. It's got this pick on the end that sometimes comes in handy but usually I just use this blade and I just go and run it under the surface of the soil or cultivate that soil. I also use this stirrup hoe. This is actually my favorite method of weeding. It's so easy. And the stirrup hoe is named because it looks like a stirrup. This little uh, portion of the, of the tool runs just beneath the surface and it wiggles back and forth a little bit. I do like to sharpen these blades and come in with a file and just give the store-bought blade, which is usually pathetic, uh, a nice little honing and uh, sharpen them up a bit. And then I've got this thing. This is a weeding spike. And for weeds with tap roots, if they get established and you miss them and you come back and say, oh man, there's a dandelion, you can shove this down into the soil and twist it and pull it up. And oftentimes it'll catch that root and pull that weed right out. This is a, a tool that I use uh, when things have gone too far. And the nice thing about the long handles, they don't have to bend down. So this comes in handy. And you don't want to stick that in somebody. Well, maybe you do. To use a stirrup hoe, you need to have loose soil. You can't really use a stirrup hoe in a mulched garden bed or a thickly mulched garden bed uh, unless you've mulched with compost that's loose. Um, in my garden beds, I've put a layer of compost on top for the winter and a lot of the areas I've left bare so that I, I'm not mulching because I've got my plant space so close together and I sowed them from seed so I just let them come up and so far I haven't put any mulch there. If I mulched, I would suppress all these weeds, but it's just as easy to come along with the, the, uh, uh, the various tools that you can run under the soil and just disturb the roots of those weeds and kill them that way. So uh, let me show you how to use a stirrup hoe. This is an ideal situation for a stirrup hoe. You can see I've got enough area in here. I can get between my plants and there are tiny little weeds that are just now starting to come up. Now I don't want to pick all those by hand, so I can bring my stirrup hoe in here and just disturb them. And it allows me to get up close to my plants here. These are pea plants. Um, without disturbing the, their roots, I can just go just under the surface. And you can see how loose the soil is here. It's so loose that it's easy to run a tool under the surface here. If I had hard soil or mulch down, I wouldn't be able to do it. So let me show you how it's done. I would basically take my stirrup hoe and rest it on the soil and just gently drag it back. I'm not even applying any force. I'm allowing the weight of the stirrup hoe to dig into the, the soil there. And you can see I can get right up to my plants and I can pull these things out. And you see how it's disturbed all these weeds now? I don't have to worry about them. I can just go along and 
scuffle the, the surface. In fact, they called it a scuffle hoe as well. Easy. And I could just go along my whole garden and do this where there's open spaces and get all my weeds out. Here's a pretty dense part of my garden. And you can see here, I've got a lot of different kinds of weeds right here. I've got some nut sedge, which is, uh, yeah, you get it young and get it out of there. It's always helpful. You've got this grassy stuff, which is pretty easy to pull. We have this wood sorrel, and it's got a real uh, lacy network of roots down in there. And so it's kind of hard to get out. But uh, right next to it, we've got some purslane. And so just around my carrots here, I go and pull out these weeds where I can. You want to eliminate the competition. There's a good example of the network of roots in this uh, wood sorrel. Look how deep that went. Kind of disturbing my carrots there. Here's some chickweed over here. Some more purslane. So you just want to go in and kind of get these weeds when they're young and look in between your rows here where all this stuff is hiding and just take it right out. It takes work. Gardening is, uh, is work. Since the last time I've weeded here, you can see these tiny little chickweed plants have started to grow and sprout. And I've got these tiny little guys all over the place now. Tiny little sprouts. But uh, these are manageable. You just come in with your tools, and, or by hand if you've got the time, and just pluck them out. But a big area, open area like this between my cabbages, that's ideal soil for a scuffle hoe or a stirrup hoe. Another aspect of maintaining your garden is not just weeding, but fertilization. If you've put in a new garden bed and you've got new soil, you probably want to find some way to fertilize your growing plants through the season as they grow. Because new soil tends to be not that developed, not that good. Uh, it doesn't have a high biodiversity living in it just yet. Fertilization is helpful. Even in my soil, in which I put uh, compost every single year, twice a year usually, I put about a, an inch to half inch, uh, an inch to two inch layer of compost over the whole thing. That compost is slow release and the, the biology releases the nutrients over time. Well, that's great. It gives nice uh, growth on my gardens, but uh, sometimes your plants, especially the ones in pots, uh, need an extra dose of fertilization. And so I like to give them that about uh, once to twice a month, depending on the plant. If they're in a pot, I'll, I'll do a, a very rigorous once a month schedule. In my garden beds, it's not that important for me to be rigorous about fertilizing with additional things like fish emulsion. But in my potted plants, it's vital. If you're growing anything in pots, and if you're growing a garden that's a container garden, then what's in your soil in that container is depleted really quickly, and there's not a lot of life in that soil to you know really release the minerals and nutrition that's found in the organic material of that soil matrix. It's gone really quick, so you gotta, you gotta fertilize. And that's one of the maintenance things we do on a schedule. You should make a schedule and keep to it. I do maybe once a month on my potted plants. Some people do twice a month. Some people do a dilute uh, fertilizer every week. But for me, I find that once a month really helps. Now, people often get uh, upset when they see gardeners using this. This is miracle Grow, And this is a big no-no in the organic gardening movement. Um, but in these days, you know what? Uh, it's difficult to be totally organic with some of the uh, challenges that have entered into the fertilizer stream that we purchase uh, in the, even in the organic market. Uh, pesticides and herbicides, especially herbicides, persistent herbicides, uh, find their way into compost and manure and hay that you purchase to use as organic amendments for your garden and it's become a very real threat. I've had people email me and send me messages uh, it, several times, especially during the spring and summer gardening season, at least once a week, that they have a problem. And it turns out it's herbicide poisoning, that they bought some organic compost or some black cow or you know something like that, and it killed their, it killed their plants. So um, something like this is made in a laboratory or in a factory or in a production refinery. All it is is just the pure elements. Yeah, it has a blue dye in it, it looks ugly, it doesn't feel organic, but it's pure and it's safe to use. 
I use it in my potted plants. I use it especially with my fig plants. And um, it does well, it does great, the plants love it. The only thing uh, that I have read about a little bit, and I haven't fully studied this out, but this is the common uh, thing people say is, well, it'll build up salts in your soil uh, over time. If you use it, you know, this uh, fake stuff, if you use it all the time, it will build up in your soil uh, bad stuff. Uh, that may be true. I don't use it in my main beds. I only use it in potting mixes. And that way, uh, in my main beds, they're protected from any side effects that might come from using uh, a, a, so a soil amendment that's um, artificial and not organic. Technically, on the chemical level, it's not, not artificial at all. It's actually the purest forms of the nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus you can get. And it has all kinds of other things in it, like iron, manganese, molybdenum, zinc. It has a lot of those things that your plants need. So it actually is pretty good stuff. But I also use uh, Dr. Earth's on the organic side. This is what I use in my main beds because this is all natural and it's inoculated with good fungus uh, and bacteria that your garden needs. For my citrus plants, I use a dedicated citrus feed. Again, this is not organic. Uh, this is a fake stuff that's blue. But it's great stuff for my trees that are in containers. I can't get such a tailored and pure fertilizer in my containers than I can with a dedicated feed. And I just use this, any kind of dedicated feed for citrus uh, is something I would use, but um, yeah, it really works in a container. So, yeah. but whatever you do and whatever you choose, don't, don't let the organic crowd, the only organic crowd shame you for using something like miracle Grow. It's a perfectly legit choice for a gardener. Uh, but whatever you choose, you have to do it on a schedule. You have to maintain your garden's fertility, especially these containers, these trees like this. They get all these figs on them because I feed them regularly. And so you've got to maintain. That's part of maintaining your garden. So we've covered weeding. We've covered fertilization. Let's move on to the most important, I think, and that's watering. Good watering practices begin with good soil. And I've got here really good soil. This soil has a lot of organic content and that organic content is chiefly there uh, to hold water, hold moisture. You don't want heavy clay in which water can't penetrate very well. It just runs off the top. You don't want sand. Sand, the water just runs straight through and your plants are left without anything. You want to amend your soil and have a good soil that's a balance between um, uh, dirt essentially, mineralized dirt, and organic material. Once you know you've got good soil, the next thing to, to consider is how to get the water onto your garden. Uh, look at my gardens. They're not that big. My garden beds are small enough where I can just use my hose and I can water my garden as, as efficiently as if I had some other kind of system in here. I'm going to be outside anyway looking at my garden, enjoying the garden, weeding in the garden. I might as well just water it by hand. But if you had a larger garden, there's all kinds of ways that you can, uh, you, you can uh, get water to your garden that uh, is more efficient and a better use of your time. There's drip tapes, there's uh, soaker hoses, there are stand pipes that you can put out in your garden that will irrigate your garden. Then there's the debate on watering from the top or watering from the soil. A drip tape or a soaker hose runs underneath the leaves of your plants. It runs right on top of the soil and slowly drips onto the soil, keeping water off of your leaves. Why is that important? In my context, it's, it's never really been an issue. I've not really had um, uh, any trouble with it. But the, 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 the thinking is, and, and the science behind it is legit, that if your leaves are always wet, you're going to get more mildew and fungus and, and uh, you know, bad things are going to happen. You're going to spread disease. The water hitting the soil is going to splash bacteria up onto your plants and cause them to get blighted like tomatoes to get this uh, early blight and, and especially on the lower leaves. That comes from watering in this style because you're splashing up a lot of stuff onto your plant. But for me, watering by hand still works. So whatever works for you, you got to get water on your garden, on your plants. It's especially important to make sure you keep your soil moist if you've got young plants, new plants, or freshly sprouted seedlings. But as we're talking about maintenance of the garden today, I'll assume that you've already got your plants up. 
they still need regular drinking. There's another issue you're going to find with watering from the top like I do. On tender plants like lettuce and radishes and things like carrots, when they're young and you water them from the top, they're going to lay down and you're going to look like you've done some bad stuff to your garden. Just like when you come back after a heavy rainstorm and all your plants are beat down. But your plants will recover. You don't have to worry about that. There's another debate about when should you water your garden. People say, oh, you shouldn't water your garden during the full sun because the beads of water that bead up on the plants, uh, well, the sun will, will come through that and that beaded water will act as a magnifying glass and you'll burn the leaves on your plant. Uh, friends, that is a myth. That is, uh, uh, if, you, if you have experienced leaf burn, it's probably not from the water droplets on your plant. Uh, there are numerous studies, numerous articles that have disproven this idea. Now, oils will do that if you have oils that beat up, if you're treating your plants with neem oil, for exa example, and you don't have an emulsifier in there to cause the, that oil to spread out and film, beaded oils have the properties that can, in fact, uh, magnify the sun into a, a, a sharp point of light and burn your plants. But you don't have to worry about that if you're watering your plants during the daytime. It's a myth. Look it up on YouTube. Uh, a lot of people swear by it, but I'm on the other camp. I will go with the papers and studies, and uh, I've been watering my plants like this for years, and I have never seen leaf burn. So, I water from the top. These little water droplets sit all day on my cabbage. All day long. I'll come back tonight, and that guy will still be there. Isn't that cool? And the cabbages have a surface uh, tension or, or properties that make that water beat up like that into essentially a little lens. But cabbage does not get burned. Most plants do not get burned. In fact, like I said, I think that that's a myth. There is an idea that you should only water in the morning uh, so that your plants can take up all the moisture they need to make it through the, hot, the heat of the day. Uh, then there's the idea that you should water your plants at the end of the day so that through the night they can recover from the heat of the day. Uh, there is a book, um, French Dirt, I think was the name of the book, and it was a memoir of a man who moved to France and started a garden. And the two local townspeople who were the chief gardeners had a war on about this, about when they should water. And it was really funny. Essentially, it doesn't matter. But uh, also, if you're watering in the heat of the day and it's 95 degrees outside, a lot of your water is going to evaporate relatively quickly so you got to choose when to water that works for you sometimes you just you just don't have time to water until you get home from work so whatever works for you but get the water on the garden all right check this out this can be deceptive when you're watering you just saw me turn the hose off and i've put a lot of water into this soil now plants are laying down it feels like a damp sponge in fact, I can't get any water really to pool up here. Let's see how deep it went. You can see it went about an inch deep before I start getting into dry soil. And even that soil is starting to become a little bit saturated as this organic material wicks all the moisture deeper into the water. Let's pull weeds while we're here. So, there's some weeds right there. So watering your garden needs to be done to maintain uh, a little bit of moisture in your soil so that your plants can thrive. And look at these plants, man, they are thriving. This whole garden this year has been awesome. So now we've covered weeding, we've covered fertilization, we've cut covered watering. There's one more part of maintaining your garden that is very important but it's the fun part. It's harvesting. I have this old gnarly pepper plant. This pepper plant was one of the ones I cut in my latest pepper pruning video, so it's about a year old. Uh, this pepper plant is not producing anymore after this harvest because we're going into the winter and I'm going to see if this plant can make it through another year. But it's loaded with peppers right now, so if you want your plants to continue to produce, if they're producing plants, uh, and by producing plants, I mean they're, they, they fruit. They're not like a lettuce or a cabbage where you come by and you harvest the whole plant at once, or a, a radish or a turnip where you pull the whole thing up and it's done. 
A plant like this, if you want it to keep on flowering and producing, keep it well picked. This is especially important with beans um, and pretty much anything that puts on fruit. If you keep it picked and maintain that plant by harvesting, you'll keep it producing. So I got a lot of jalapenos here. There's a nice pepper. Now this pepper plant has been putting all of its energy into ripening those peppers. Now that we've harvested those peppers, we're maintaining our plant and that plant is now free to blossom again, if, it, if it's the right season, if it wants to. But it's free to do that and so we've freed up resources from the fruit the fruit we want to eat and now it can put its resources toward um, uh, making new fruit for you by blossoming. Now a bed like this needs to be maintained as well through harvesting or what we might call thinning. This is all bok choy and this has been broadcast spread so that the plants are very close together. The beauty of bok choy is you can eat it right now. You can pull a plant out and that baby bok choy is delicious in a soup, or in a salad, or you just munch on it in the garden. So that's one thing that you have to do is maintain your garden by thinning. So we'll pull some of these out and put them aside for soup. I hope you found this video to be useful. I've enjoyed making it for you and we really appreciate your subscriptions. If you haven't subscribed, please do. It really encourages us to make more videos, especially these kind of basic primers on how to garden. So there you go, how to maintain a garden. Hey, we'll talk to you next time. Happy gardening. Bye-bye.